Good evening and welcome to The Square. Tonight is a second part series on a conversation that we had last week on graduate youth employment and the future of work. And tonight we are going to focus again on youth employment, specifically looking at youth uh, in terms of skills development as well as youth empowerment. I'm very happy to hear, have here with us on the show people who will give us perspective, not from a policy perspective like we did last week, but in terms of youth, uh, big youth platforms, continental platforms, uh, as well as big uh, corporate employers and on the job training that they provide to graduate youth. And I'm happy to welcome with us, uh, I will start with our guest, uh, Uli Keita, who is the Executive Director of Youth Connect Hub, uh, youth, uh, youth Connect Africa Hub. Oh. Uli, uh, great to have you on the square. Great. Also joining us is Dana Mukundwa, who is the Head of Investment and Social Impact at Equity Bank uh, Rwanda. Dana, great to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. Great. Uh, my name's Sik. My name's Dana Mpisi, host of The Square. As always, I'm joined by The Square as an panelist. I have with us uh, Charlie Haber. Always a pleasure having you. Samia Dana, how are you? Good. Brenda Namata, always a pleasure to have you on The Square. Thank you, Dana. Resident panelists. And um, before we kick off, like we always do, midweek highlights from the resident panelists, uh, things that have caught their attention thus far in the week. Uh, Charles, I'll kick off with you. It's been an eventful two weeks. Um, in Rwanda, lots of things happening. Is there something you'd like to share? Um, I, I, I wish I didn't have to say this with Banner uh, on, on the show. So for that matter, I, I will not talk about it. But um, uh, accountability not. is one thing that is on top of RPF's agenda and the fact that uh, the outgone minister uh, of, uh, I believe, uh, culture, uh, I think his portfolio has changed and a little bit um, was caught on the wrong side of, 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 of the law even though investigations are still pending. But I um, was a little bit surprised that he... He came out on Twitter to be very uh, to, to apologetic. Make, yeah, yeah, no, apologetic, and to make the judges work easier. It's not a very common thing, but uh, I'll commend him for for, for that. Yeah. Rena, any midweek highlights? Um, I can see you. You're nodding your head furiously in disagreement. What? Uh, why are you? Why are you surprised? No, I, I mean he. You see, before a court of law, you are allowed to to plead guilty or innocent or to allow also justice to take its course. Uh, in the event that you, you come out before even investigations are complete and you start saying, uh, uh, making utterances that you might regret before, before uh, uh, the judge, I, I don't think it's the smartest of things to do. Okay. Yes. Uh, it's my legal opinion. <laughs> Personal your, opinion. Uh, yeah. Legal opinion. You, Personal legal opinion. You're Personal. planning to give him some pro bono aid, legal aid. Uh, I think to the extent that someone feels uh, obliged um, to, to ask for forgiveness, um, that's a statement on its own. I think so. Um, my personal highlight, of course, is the uh, ongoing, um, I don't know whether to call it a scandal or, you know, some of us had been saying uh, Miss Rwanda, you know, Miss Rwanda, Miss Rwanda, and we were the devils. So um, it's unfortunate seeing um, young people involved in these things, um, young women, you know. Um, yeah, it's quite unfortunate, um, but we hope that it goes beyond the young people because we know young people usually are supported by, you know, some other people. So we need to see the faces of the other people. Um, uh, it's hard to believe that, you know, young people can just run uh, a racket without, you know, uh, we are still waiting. Uh, for the sponsors of Miss Rwanda to send a message. They haven't done so, and we know what silence means. Um, we cannot say um, making a stance, even when the investigations, that would be a problem. I don't think so. So we are still looking at the sponsors of Miss Rwanda and judging you. 
Mm. I may, you know. <laughs> we are judging no, them. You're not mincing your words no. at all. Yeah. Um, thank you for your make the highlights. Uh, for sure, uh, those two, those two, are really midweek highlights, um, you know, uh, the, the, the um, arrest uh, of both the Minister Edward Bomholichi and the Miss Randa organizer, uh, Prince Kid uh, Ishimi Diodone. So we're waiting to see really justice run its course. Uh, but there's been a lot of public opinion on the matter, as we've yeah. seen from Randa and uh, social media feeds. And yeah, let's, let's wait and see. But um, a lot of things have to change um, with regards to both, um, both issues. Yeah, and, and, and just to say that I hope it doesn't uh, become like what we've seen before. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, there's public outcry on social media, uh, something is trending, and it just disappears. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, nothing ever really gets it done, yes, you know. Yes. Yeah. And especially when it comes to women. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had so many cases of women going on social media and saying, look, I was harassed, and somehow it just disappears, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So hopefully this um, doesn't lead to nowhere, mm. and we will really see a fundamental change, mm. you know, Absolutely. yeah, an overhaul of, of some of these systems yeah. that leads to change, because yeah. women are tired, you know, they're so tired of being on social media and crying out and, and being accused and victimized. It's been going on for ages, mm. yeah. I agree. Um, so thank you for uh, tuning in to our, uh, our viewers, to our guests, thank you very much as well. I'd like to just say, uh, like we did last week, you know, the conversation keeps on going before the show, during the show, and after the show. So keep the comments coming use, using hashtag the square RW. Um, so I would like to just kick off by talking about um, skills development needs, not only locally or regionally, but all across the continent. Uh, like I said earlier on, uh, we touched on the issue of skills development in part one of this conversation last week. And tonight we'd like to hear from... Uh, you know, corporates, big corporates, uh, big employers like Equity Bank and um, continental platforms like Youth Connect uh, Hub Africa. And, um, you know, just giving us a perspective of what, from your perspective, both of you, on what skills are necessary for youth to adopt in the constantly evolving labor market. And um, not just in Rwanda, but the continent uh, at large. And I will, I will start off with you, Eli, uh, Eli, Uli, sorry, Keita. Yes, thank you. Um, when you look at the continent, for me, we have to first see our human resources. So we're a continent of 1.3 billion people, out of which 450 millions are young people between the ages of 15 and 35, according to the AU definition of a young person. And out of those 450 millions, you have 60% under the age of 25 years old. So you have the people. And then economically, if you take our GDP, we're at 3.7 right now, going to 6.7 in 2030. So economically, we're also growing. So you have the people, you have the economies, at least at the national levels, our GDPs are growing. If you look at the GDP in Rwanda, it's on the rise in Africa. So. You have all these young people entering the job market. What do we need to do to build their skills so that they are employable when they're at that age of getting a job and making money? So I would say, first of all, the digital economy. Um, COVID has shown us that we all need to be digitally literate in this world, um, whether it's social media to make income to generate business, or if it's software engineering, or coding, information technology management, anything that you need in the dig digital space, young people need to have these skills to be marketable. You also have the green economy. You know, for a long time we've said that agriculture was the development sector of Africa. Now it's evolving. but. You have agriculture and you have the environment. So work related to agriculture, the protection of the environment, uh, soil, fertility, land degradation, anything related to the green economy, we need to build the capacities of our young people so that they can serve in that sector. And of course, the service economy, whether you're an entrepreneur or you're um, 
a bureaucrat or you're a fashion designer, you need to have those soft skills, such as interpersonal communication, um, dealing with boards, board management, project management, leadership, those soft skills that you would need to lead, to show, to uh, better service your clients. So those three big digital, uh, green, and service economies are, for me, what we need to look at to build the skills of our young people. Thank you very much, uh, Uli. Um, I'll definitely come back to you um, with a bit of follow-up because I would like to know what Youth Connect Africa uh, Hub is doing on the continent. Um, you know, it's on 20, in 26 countries, if I'm not mistaken, and you know, some a bit of tangible examples in terms of skill development that um, the platform that you had uh, is doing. Uh, but I'd like to also hear from Dana Mukundwa uh, in terms of you know, equity is one of the big uh, employers in Rwanda uh, as well as the region. So before we get to you know, on the job training that I know uh, your institution is heavily involved with um, as of recent, not only Rwanda but you know, in Uganda and Kenya, what, what skills do you think are necessary from your perspective as a, as a corporate employer? When young people come to you, how prepared are they? What do you think they need to better themselves with in terms of skills development, just starting with Rwanda? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe I'll start with also the, the quick pace at which uh, the world is changing, uh, mainly being brought by the fourth uh, industrial uh, revolution that mainly, mainly focuses on um, uh, skills that are redirected into digital mainly. So uh, to me, I'll, I'll, I'll tackle it into this direction of uh, covering the skills gap. And I'll, I'll break it down into two, the hard skills uh, and the soft skills. Mainly the hard skills uh, will mainly uh, be on training, uh, you know, the brain, the, the mind, but also uh, tooling the hands to work. And in that direction, uh, I'll talk about uh, TVET. Uh, TVET's uh, coming in to, to, to solve that skills gap and also create the jobs that we need. So when you look at it, uh, recently uh, the Ministry of Education has really done a great job uh, on uh, focusing on making sure that by 2024, uh, the TVET graduates are coming to a level of 60%. And what does this mean to the job market? Um, it shows that uh, this uh, particular TVET hands-on uh, hard skills are there working. One, they are you know, creating jobs. Two, they're coming together to do activities that they love. And when they come to seek the bank for funding, the bank has a basis to look uh, maybe on the work they're doing, maybe they're seeking for a working capital. So it's, it's, it's much quicker. And to me, I would say that uh, I would add the youth, not only to go seeking for the white collar jobs, they are okay, they are fine. But also if Africans, uh, if the youth in Rwanda regionally uh, focus on equipping themselves technically on the things they love, it will be very good and uh, will quickly um, cover the skills gap. And uh, maybe one other thing that I'll, I'll, I'll maybe mention is that uh, before I, I jump to the soft skills, is that looking at the employment and employment gap that is currently growing, it's too much. When you look at the National Institute of Statistics Randa data as of 2021 December, you find that youth uh, labor is categorized into three. There are those that are out of uh, the labor market, around 47%. There are those that are employed, which is 37%, and there is 16%, which is unemployed. But when you add those out of the market and those that are unemployed, you find that we are around 63% of youth not actually employed. In this case, um, the, the soft skills will come in also to enable the hard skills because you might be working, but you also need you know, leadership skills, you need interpersonal skills, you need teamwork. You need to learn, you need to um, train yourself. So that comes with the soft skills that will work together to cover the skills gap. And, and what the bank has actually uh, done is that uh, we engage into a lot of training to the youth. Maybe I'll, I'll just elaborate more on it later uh, to see that the youth are well equipped uh, with the right uh, financial literacy, with the right entrepreneurial education, with the right digital literacy to make sure that they are ready 
to be able to even create their jobs with the entrepreneurial skills given, but also be able uh, to work well in the environments uh, they are, uh, hence uh, reducing the, the, uh, the skill gap that we are, we are actually trying to tackle uh, as a country, as the region, and as Africa. As Thank, you. Thank you very much, Dana. Um, I'd like to just go back quickly to we leave before, uh, you know, I hear from the resident pan panelists, Bernard and Charles, um, with regards to, okay, yes, we're talking about these are the needs, these are, these are the gaps, this is what's needed to be done. So what are you doing? W what is your platform doing in this regard? If you could give us some tangible examples. Um, I know we'll talk about that later as well, also you with Dana, but, you know, if we could hear from, from you, uh, Uli, in terms of, yeah, what's, what's, what's currently being done, not only Rwanda, but continentally as well. Yes, as Youth Connect Africa Hub, we act as a connector. Uh, we bring together uh, governments, private sector, international organizations, donors, everyone together so that they actually contribute to what we call the Triple E agenda, uh, which is empowerment, education, and employment or entrepreneurship. So in terms of um, education, for example, we work with governments to have better policies for children, for young people to stay in school. We advocate for better reforms in terms of education, in terms of uh, grants that we give to uh, young people who are going to universities, for example, to continue higher education. And in terms of uh, non-formal education, we work to promote the Tibet um, best practices. Uh, as Youth Connect has been doing a lot of work in Rwanda since 2012. Um, it's been 10 years in making, and uh, Rwanda is really uh, the proof of concept for Youth Connect to show that if you bring together all the stakeholders as one, to really promote this employment, empowerment, entrepreneurship, and education for young people, you will su succeed. So we work at the policy level, doing reforms, we advocating for better reforms. We work with politics, decision makers. We work with the private sector. We work with mobilizers, whether it's uh, artists or influencers and we work with the young people themselves so that everybody together, we are able to move. Um, but we are a connector. We don't uh, implement directly, but we provide the connection between the young people and the uh, different stakeholders so that they are, the young people are connected to social economic transformation because that is our mandate. Mm -hmm. And has there been any sort of changes, you know, you know, in terms of some success stories, some numbers that you can share. Uh, you know, it's a 10-year-old platform um, founded here in Rwanda, but, you know, in different countries. Um, this connection of connecting youth to all these key stakeholders, what are some of the tangible changes that you've witnessed, um, the, the platform has witnessed during its, its tenure? Absolutely. So we went from one country in 2012. Now we are in 26 countries, so it shows that African governments are actually liking what's happening in Rwanda and they're liking the Youth Connect model and they are scaling it up. So for example, if you take the Hangout, Hangout is one of the models that we use. Uh, in Rwanda, we have a Hangout in different uh, uh, um, places, in, in secondary schools, in universities where young people are connected through the internet. And we pick a subject, for example, that is of importance to the Rwandan youth, and they hang out, just as the name says it, they um, hang out digitally and exchange with each other, and you have experts sometimes addressing the young people, you have decision makers addressing the young people, you have uh, business leaders. So that model is something that the youth on the continent are really liking because it gives them an opportunity whether they're in a farm uh, far away from anyone and if they have internet connection, uh, we, we can also facilitate that internet connection. We facilitate for them to be connected so that they see what's happening in Rwanda, what's happening in other African countries um, pertaining to various youth uh, topics. So the Hangout uh, model, for example, is very important. One other thing that I would quickly mention is uh, the Youth Connect Dialogue, which is where we have 
uh, His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Rwanda, who comes in person and interacts with the young people. This is very, very innovative. And young people love this interaction because it makes them closer to the decision maker. And they are free to ask questions. Uh, you know, they interact with the president. And this is something that we would really like to scale in other African countries so that the young people feel free um, to really exchange with the heads of state and uh, to discuss on the agenda that are important for young people in their countries. So the, the Youth Connect Dialogue is also um, one that is very uh, successful. It has been very successful in Rwanda, and we are trying to scale it in other countries. And I think uh, that uh, that will be uh, a good model because uh, exchanging communication is key. If we're able to exchange, we can resolve all of uh, the misunderstandings that, that uh, young people may have. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'd like to hear from uh, the resident panelists. I know we talked about this last week, uh, but you know we were kind of talking about this with different chunks of information, trying to break it down. But tonight we really want to focus on skills development. So you may reiterate what you said or, or just uh, even add to the conversation. Brenna, I'll kick off with you. Um, I know last week you talked about you know, problem solving uh, thinking. Uh, that's going to be an important mindset in terms of uh, skills development, amongst other things, of course. But yeah, I'd like to hear from you um, on this topic tonight. Yeah, um, as she was speaking, I was um, kind of going through my mind and thinking about um, di the digital space. Um, the more you hear about digital, it's always good also to give it perspective. I am concerned about the digital divide, whether it's in terms of income inequality or the gender gap. As we talk about the digital space, how do we ensure that we don't leave many people behind? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I feel that when you just take a look right now, um, look at where are the majority of the youth employed currently. How many are in the digital space? Let's begin with that. How many? Do we have an estimate of, but if we use, for instance, our education system to say we are training you know, jobs for the future to the earlier discussion that we had, how many of our youth are actually in that ecosystem, the digital space? We may recall that um, we have had hubs before, um, which if we, go, if we look at, for instance, KIST, which used to be the center of excellence, uh, it produced someone I have never forgotten, I'm very proud of. Look at Hey, hey Rwanda. Um, you know, getting exposed at, um, you know, at, at the KIST then, world-class training, they go to MIT, and you know, they come back and do something, build a company that is quite successful. You take it outside, hey, hey, Rwanda, you look at brands that are coming up now, um, House of Tayo, Uzuri, um, Motions. These are really young people, yeah? But when you profile them, they are from a certain class, yeah? And they've gotten opportunities um, because they are from a certain, you know, so how do you ensure that you have those people that are from the remotest parts of our country also beginning to play in that space? And for me, I think that's the elephant in the room. Uh, because as it is today, when you look at the national conversation around the digital space, you still have a certain class of people, you know, whether it's young people, uh, young people from, you know, Green Hills will be more exposed. There will be more um, digital survey, you know. Um, a child from Green Hills will be more digital survey compared to a graduate from University of Rwanda, you know. So we, we really need to have that critical conversation. How do you bridge the gap as you talk about the digital space, ensuring that you leave no one behind? Now, we know that... Um, there's so much work going on in that space again, even with Tibet. But 
One, we need the data to inform this discussion, um, to map out and know who exactly are we leaving behind. I haven't seen any statistics to that effect, whether it's in terms of the youth or women. Until we do that, it's difficult to come up with the right approach. My final submission would be on looking ahead. We are talking about Africa. And again, going back to the impact of the pandemic, the global environment is so, so competitive. It's so, so competitive. Uh, if you look at startups, um, it's so competitive. So how do you create an ecosystem that allows young Rwandans to compete, not just at the regional level, but even at the continental level? Let's look at Tap and Go, one of the most also innovative uh, products by a young person who's done so well. After the pandemic, scaling up, they've tried to go outside of Rwanda. Can we have a conversation around how successful they are outside of Rwanda? Again, the picture is mixed because you tend to see that our startups by young people tend to do well locally. When they try to go out, you don't get the same level of success. Why? You know, so let's have, you know, a kind of reality check to say, um, if you have tap and go working so well in Rwanda, how do you support it and to grow even in different environments? Yeah. Thank you very much, Brenna. Uh, very, I agree, very spot on with your uh, valid points. You know, let's critically look at the reasons as, as to why some of these skills are not being scaled up in other countries by our youth in Rwanda. Um, absolutely agree on, on having that reality check on how can we help uh, and how can we also help improve um, these issues they're facing. Charles, over to you. Um, I think I want to throw a spanner in the works and ask myself who isn't youth. Um, when, when you look at our top echelon, look at the president, over the weekend I was having a conversation with some friends and um, these guys told me, you guys are very lucky. You have a young president. Look at us uh, and see who is running for president. And these guys are, are, are very staunch Raila supporters. Uh, uh, and uh, they, you know, see what is going to happen to us and compare us with yourselves. Can we change the conversation and, sort of, and stop talking about leaders of our countries? Then you put that conversation into what Uli has just said, and Uli has just categorized me as an old man and, 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 and not youthful. Uh, I, I, I wish she knew that recently at Banners Gusawa, I, I was made to sit in front with, with, with the old men. Uh, so, but I want to put that into context in regards to, to skills and, and, and experience, and that's, that's really where the dilemma comes in uh, people of uh, Diana's job in their day-to-day -day lives and say, are you going to really push this youth agenda? Look at the dazzling statistics that they are giving us that people are aged in their 20s. Uh, they account for 80% of the population uh, at a time when we're still rebuilding our economy and we don't have the required experience. So I think the point I'm trying to raise is that we need to tread uh, very carefully because despite the fact that, uh, that we might have people who, no, we do have people who are, job, who are uh, young in age, uh, age is just a number, uh, but we, we still need uh, a fine balance between, between the people who have been around for a little younger than the young ones. Now, so I, I think that's the, that, that's the first point I wanted to raise. The, the, the second one is really around the soft skills, and I'm glad that uh, both Uli and, and, uh, and uh, Diana have brought this up. I'm going to link this directly with the events that we are having in this period. So, and we're very lucky that uh, we have back-to-back -back events with the highlights that I'm just going to pick out being Baal and, okay. and Choga. Uh, I know there's an exercise going on across different uh, establishments that are directly linked to those two main events on just simple things like having a driver whose job is not only to drive. Uh, 
the spin-off is a lot higher. You know, I, I, my friends and I invested in an investment in, in an entertainment business, and we're extremely worried that some of our barmen and waiters and waitresses can only serve uh, 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 what you have told them to do and not necessarily have a conversation with you when you ask them, how is your town? Yeah, and they're like, fine, and they immediately run away, you know. <laughs> so um, the, the, the direct uh, um, uh, impact, sorry, investment that needs to be done into enhancing these, the, these uh, skills, even if we are calling them soft, they're coming in as part and parcel of, of whatever you're going to do in your day-to-day -day life. You don't, I don't know a single architect whose job is just to draw a nice building that they cannot explain what it looks like then. So, uh, Charles, that's a very valid point that you're making. And I like that you kind of brought the conversation to a more practical um, yeah. sense. Uh, and just to reiterate, if I understood you correctly, you're saying, you know, uh, we're going to have, you know, the value chain of, this, of these events is, is huge. You know, we cannot undermine it. And, uh, you know, if you have a driver who is taking around, um, you know, a client or two around Kigali City, and the client wants to ask them a couple of questions, you're saying some of our youth or, like you said, youth, I don't know if this driver will be a young person, maybe they're above the threshold, but, you know, the soft skills, will they be able to have conversations, will they be able to be ambassadors of Rwanda, you know, on a more human, mm -hmm. um, practical level, and you are saying you have worries about yes. that. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and most people actually will tell you that um, the first impression they get uh, about the country usually the people yeah from the cow you know from the airport yes um, because that's when someone is really asking the basic questions yeah. uh, where can I eat uh, where I can where can I get forex um, mm. what time you know um, are there nightclubs that kind of soft mm. uh, conversation mm. so if you try to engage it, someone and maybe the driver is not really up to it Definitely, it will be a problem. There's actually a myth around that, and if, if you look at it, it may hold some water, that, that, that everyone who is in a form of job in one way or another in Rwanda is, is a spy, because <laughs> they will not want to engage you in a conversation. You know, to, to try and have a conversation with these, all these cameramen who are around us, and they, and they will be very cagey. Uh, uh, so the direct impression you have is that the guy's job is only to film you. That the other cab guy's drivers, the cab guy's job is only to drive you from the airport to the hotel. You try and ask him how was the weather yesterday, is it going to rain tonight, where should I go tomorrow, what is happening tonight. The guy is only concentrating and the, the, the thing that comes into your mind is that that guy has been briefed. I know. <laughs> to just observe where you are and where you're coming from and he's, he's, he's doing uh, his second job. Yeah. But I think, I mean... Yeah. I think that's a myth that needs to be demystified, for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, you raise very valid uh, it's, points. And it's a big problem, actually. Mm -hmm. It's a big it problem. to be demystified. But you raise valid points in how do we also prepare our people with soft skills to really tap into these huge, huge, um, you know, events that government has invested in securing and bringing and just to top off, um, you know, some of the opportunities and benefits um, Charles, that, you, that you've mentioned. Um, I would like to go to the next part of the conversation, which is uh, on the job training uh, or, or you know, workplace training. Uh, but before I do, you know, I'd like to hear from you, Dana, very briefly, and Uli, just based on what Berna and Charles have said, uh, you know, soft skills, um, you know, the digital divide or the, in terms of youth or in terms of gender, you know, uh, just very briefly, if, you, if you'd like to just uh, respond to them. And Dana, briefly, I'll kick off with you before we go to Uli. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe uh, I'll start on the point of uh, uh, letting our viewers know that uh, Equity Bank is a commercial bank, but it runs on two engines. Uh, it runs on the social engine and the commercial engine. And our vision is mainly to champion the social economic prosperity uh, of the people of Africa. And what does this mean? It means that uh, as the, the, the co commercial engine or the economic engine uh, serves to, to, I mean, offer the financial services. The social engine is coming in now to give that impact that we need um, our customers, especially the youth, uh, to benefit from. And, and some of the pillars that we have in the social engine are coming to also solve the, the social skills that you've been mentioning. Um, we have uh, about six pillars within the social engine uh, that equity uh, drives through our uh, equity group foundation. And uh, maybe if I start with the education and leadership uh, development pillar, 
in that pillar we have two flagship uh, programs uh, that uh, usually look at empowering uh, the next generational leaders. You've been giving an example of uh, that driver that you know is driving and they don't want to look on the sides. So maybe this this person has not been trained to have that empathetic way of you know engaging the the other people that they're working with because the the person that he or she is driving is a stakeholder, is, is a customer that needs to feel that comfort. So what we do is that we pick it from the grassroots uh, in this youth empowerment uh, discussion we are on. Equity looks at picking the, the, the scholars at a, at a much younger age. So with our two uh, programs in the uh, educational leadership development pillar, we have Wings to Fly that picks uh, academically gifted stu uh, students from primary six uh, but with poor backgrounds to take them through uh, the secondary school education. But they don't only get that payment, they're trained, they're empowered. These young children uh, have uh, mentors at schools who talk to them, who teach them about leadership, who teach them teamwork, who teach them uh, communication skills. And you notice that when these students are gone through um, uh, their secondary education, they're actually better at public speaking, at interaction, you know, at engaging. And when they reach at Senior Six, now another program under the Education Leadership Pillar comes in, which is called Equity Leaders Program. So this program picks the top performing scholars in the country and then brings them to do internships with the bank. So the bank does an induction with them, but the induction is not only about what the bank does, but about also leadership skills, mentorship skills, you know, preparing them uh, better for the job market. And when you look at it in this way, uh, the impact that has happened is so uh, huge. Uh, if you look at us being a regional bank that is in different countries, uh, we have currently impacted so many in that wings to fly around 36,000 plus. And we're looking at around 17,000 plus with education, uh, with the equity leaders program. So these students tomorrow will be the ones that actually will give that triple effect to the scholars they go to to study with at university. So to me, I believe that the trainings the bank is offering through that, uh, you know, uh, soft skills on communication, on leadership, and also entrepreneurial skills. We are training these kids to start thinking to be entrepreneurs even before they finish school. The second key one that also tackles on what you've been mentioning is our, our second pillar called enterprise development and financial inclusion. So this one focuses now at empowering uh, the, the, the MSMEs, but of course, which make a huge part of uh, youth, but also not only dealing with those that are already founded, but also coming to train the youth uh, through uh, the three uh, business development, uh, entrepreneurship, and uh, financial literacy to put them at a level where they, they can be able to stand firm and say that now I can actually save with the bank, I can actually reach a level of you know, going to the bank to seek for X, Y, Z service. Uh, the trainings uh, have done a great impact. You can see that there is transformation, uh, both on the hard skills, uh, empowerment, but also on the soft skills. Maybe one other one that I'll, 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 I'll mention is on the food and agriculture. As we very much well know is that 30% uh, uh, of the country's GDP is, is from food and agriculture. But this sector, uh, most of the youth it's, it's a sector that the youth are not really looking into. And yet, if you look at it in this perspective, we eat every day. You know, we, 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 it's, it's one sector that will never go uh, down despite uh, the COVID periods, despite the good periods. It's a sector that, you know, will be there. So what the bank has done is that we are putting a lot of effort in empowering the youth, especially in food and agriculture, through encouraging them to come up with cooperatives, uh, where they come together and then we engage like-minded uh, partners to come in and maybe offer guarantees to subsidize them to be able to get, uh, you know, the bank products. And in that case, jobs are created, access to markets are gotten because the bank does not only uh, push them to go into cooperatives and do that, but what we also do is that we link them. If we have a customer who is a startup and they're struggling, but then there's an off-taker who has to buy their crops, then we link them. In that way, there's uh, job creation, there's unemployment uh, uh, reduced, and uh, 
of course strain is given to to them both soft and and hard to to um you know deliver that and then maybe the, the one other one that i'll go on is on the social protection pillar that you also have that has done a lot on refugee camps and host communities uh, you very well know that recently uh, uh, the excellency signed an agreement with the british government and we are having uh, more human capital coming from the uh, uh, British government to come in Rwanda. And when you look at it in that way, the bank has also supported to train the, the refugee, uh, refugees in the refugee camps. We train them on financial literacy, uh, entrepreneurship education. Um, we also train them on a lot of, uh, you know, uh, digital literacy. You kept on talking about digital. Most of them have created jobs. Most of them are agents now. Uh, you know the bank has a big platform of agents around the country, so they're earning commissions, they're transforming their lives. But not only that, they're also taught to, you know, all those skills on leadership and and stuff like that. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll end on those pillars that are directly related to that. And, uh, and what we are doing is to definitely make sure that the youth not only... Um, uh, stay at that level but they're also growing and we we measure the transition at least ben i mentioned uh, uh, there are no statistics but at least the bank is trying to measure the and uh, currently we've impacted over 5146 refugees in uh, all the five refugee camps in the country and we see a bigger impact thank you thank you dana um yeah, we'd definitely love to hear more, uh, but you know, time, time not uh, time withstanding. We we will we'll have to just uh, cut you short. But thank you for giving us a really fantastic, broad, uh, you know, paintbrush uh, sort of picture on what the bank is doing. And we wanted to hear your perspective as a, a corporate, you know, as an employer, big employer, uh, especially from from uh, the work they do you, you're doing on on the job training. So it's great to know that Equity Bank Rwanda is doing that. And um, you know, I am hoping that other institutions uh, around the country are also engaging in this sort of thing. It's more like a CSR arm, uh, but in, eventually what it does is inadvertently it, it helps improve the situation preparing um, our youth for the drug market. And um, I really like to think that other uh, corporates are doing the same thing. Um, I'd like to uh, go to you, Uli, uh, just also briefly. You know, um, Diana talked about the on-the-job training and that sort of thing. Um, from your perspective as a Youth Connect um, Africa Hub uh, Executive Director, how successful do you think these trainings are um, in the sort of causal effect to higher employability? Um, what, what's your take on that? Yes, these job readiness trainings are very effective, actually. Uh, we just had, the, not just, but in October, last October, we had the Youth Connect Africa Summit in Ghana, uh, which was the first time we took the summit out of Rwanda, organized by another African government. And we brought young entrepreneurs from Rwanda, from uh, Zimbabwe, from many African countries, uh, the 26 uh, member states of the Youth Connect Africa Hub members, to Ghana to showcase what the impact of Youth Connect has been uh, doing for them. and you could see these young entrepreneurs who testify, who gave testimonies to say, with, before Youth Connect, I didn't know how to uh, do a budget. I didn't know how to do financial management. I didn't know how to use the computer. I didn't know how to um, even talk to customers, customer service. So all the, all the soft skills that we're talking about, because these young people have gone through the boot camp uh, through the Youth Connect uh, Rwanda uh, program, for example, they have acquired so many skills to be able to increase their businesses, to increase their incomes. So it's really beautiful when you see these young people giving real tangible results, impacts on their lives because they've gone through these soft skills trainings. Um, I'd like to maybe touch on what Diana, you've said about um, reaching uh, the last mile, bridging the digital gap. Um, our governments are doing a lot in that sense. I know all of the African governments are really investing a lot in the fiber optic, getting internet to the last village. But we also need corporate, we need businesses like Equity Bank to come and accompany the government because 
they cannot, the government cannot do it all alone. We need the private sector. MTN has a role to play. Liquid has a role to play. Orange, all of these telecommunication agencies can really accompany the government to make sure that the little boy or the little girl in that last mile in that village has access to the internet. So that's something that we are also advocating. We're trying to encourage uh, businesses uh, to really invest in, in what the governments are doing in Africa to bridge the digital gap. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Uli. Briefly, uh, Charles and Brenner, before we go to our social media feed, uh, Charles, I'll kick off with you. Any response you have to... Yeah, just uh, a comment uh, and from what the, the point you, you raised around corporate social responsibility. Where the world is going today and, and where it has gone, I think it's, it's no longer a, a CSR uh, affair to be able to do initiatives like what Diana is telling us they're doing. Uh, I think international financial reporting standards are also requiring that uh, all businesses in whatever way they, in as long as they have to report uh, um, by the IFRS standards to do what they call ESG, and that's, you know, to follow your own environmental, social, and governance uh, uh, criteria. So wh whatever you're doing, it's not really a favor you're doing to, to, to the people or the community within which you operate or the circles within which you operate. You're actually obligated to, 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 to play a, a significant role. So, uh, but the other thing also is just to give credit where it's due. Um, uh, the initiatives that Diana has mentioned to us, I know uh, Mastercard Foundation has also come up with an amazing uh, program around uh, the youth as well. Uh, and it's initiatives like this, and if, I believe that's the point Uli is, 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 is driving home, that, that, that will create uh, uh, a significant difference. I still insist, however youth focused they should be, they should also consider the, the, the people at the top who are, who are giving the youth these opportunities. And I'll give a classic example of farmers um, um, to, to, to Banner's point around the rural areas. If you have a 70 year old farmer, uh, do not uh, ignore him because he's not youthful, because he is he's capable of employing 500 youth on his farm is if he's given that kind of support. So it's just that the point I'm raising is that we need to have a critical uh, appreciation of uh, impacting the youth. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thanks, Charles. Brenna? I think I, I like the conversation with um, equity. Um, it's good that we, we are seeing uh, corporates uh, walk the talk. Um, it's no brainer that the more societies thrive, the better for the business. And we know this even from the pandemic. The more businesses uh, struggled and closed, the more there were less opportunities, even for big corporates. You know, uh, if you speak to the banks, their clients, if their clients are struggling, they have issues with NPLs, you know. So I think there's a business case to really do more for society. Now, beyond um, just focusing on initiatives outside the, their main operations, um, I hope that corporates will begin to go beyond that and even start from within the organization. Because sometimes the corporate culture is, is so toxic. You know, it's so toxic, it's impossible for young people. Yeah. So as you go out um, you know, and, and create these ad hoc projects uh, where you're supporting uh, young people, well done. But how about even within the organization, where are the opportunities for young people? Are these young people being promoted? Or they are simply, and, and I, I must say this, most of these uh, corporates have these uh, undergraduate systems you know, where they say, uh, we are training young people, so they will come for the, like she said, for the best, get you on the job and say, we are training you. And you get to do all the work. And you're paid the least, simply because they're saying they're training you. You know, I've, I've seen this because sometimes we, we have 
Oh God, okay. Sometimes you do it at your place. <laughs> no, 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 no. We are not doing it. We we have people who want to work with us and we are saying, no, we can't afford it. Yeah. 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 You're being honest about it. Yes, yes. We, we can't afford it. Um, but the thing is, we have corporates that take advantage of young people, you know, uh, simply because young people are looking for opportunities, you know. So these graduate programs come, they get the best, and they get them to do all the hard work and they do, the one, the promotions come late, and you have these young people really getting stressed at work, you know. So let's try to, to you know, improve the environment, not just outside, but also start improving the culture inside for young people. Thank Can you. I just give a, a practical example about what Bana has just said? Yes. Uh, uh, and but very valid point. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Extremely valid point. And I think Uli, Uli is the one who alluded to, to the importance of the soft skills. And when, we, when you just took up, when, when, when you look at, at language, communication, and, and, uh, and confidence, uh, Typically, when there are now any other uh, person who's in charge of recruitment or any recruitment agency is looking for uh, uh, an entry-level position, they'll say, you must have a degree in this or you must have a qualification, you know, at least university qualification in this and this. So they will end up with all these amazing graduates. They will take them through the programs that uh, the training uh, 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 that Ban has just mentioned, and if they are good, they will grow through the ranks. But guess what? When they are out here, mm. they can hardly express themselves. So, n well, not all of them, but the Dianas of this world do not, uh, are not representative of, of the workforce that we have. You know, I, I know Diana, Diana Mshisi, you struggle quite a bit with certain organizations that cannot find an eloquent person to send onto the square. And it is not really an English issue, but we said it last week again, that you will try and pick whatever language uh, uh, at that it. other person is good at, and you will struggle to find. And that's just language. It will go to communication. It will go to confidence. It will go to dressing. Mm. It will go to, 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 to a few other things. So I think uh, uh, I just wanted to emphasize what Bana is saying, that, that let, 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 if the corporates can also uh, put a uh, 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 little bit of effort in improving their own people. Mm. Because at the end of the day, it pains so much to see a guy come out of government he has served government for 26 years, and they cannot express themselves. Yeah. Thank you very much, Charles. I'd like us to just go quickly to our Twitter feed. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left, and uh, the first tweet, if we could have it on our screens, is from Richard Gwedira, who says, um, the crucial element of skills development is the ability of the education sector to meet demands of the labor market. Uh, TVET, vocational training, is good, but it's not fully responsive to the market situation. New industries in Rwanda require a different set of skills. Spot on, uh, Richard. Uh, hopefully, we'll have a, another part of this conversation looking at... Uh, perspectives from academia. Uh, we have another uh, tweet coming in from Saramba who says, thanks for the show team. I think generally a lot of efforts should be put in place to strengthen the link between education system and training system and the labor market. This, thus this would improve the employability of youth and disadvantaged youth in particular uh, should be included. A recurring theme we're seeing on this mm. is the link between education and the labor market. Mm. It's not just left to you know, employers in the private and public sector. Uh, we have another tweet coming in um, from Dolapo who says, a salient points by all, soft skills keep on evolving like updated apps on phones, which means people ought to be, more, ought to be consciously developing themselves too. Governments cannot be the ones to ensure people's self-development. The competition is global now. Um, very, very good points. Uh, we have another tweet coming in from the same person, Dolapo, saying that um, the role of mentorship and access to role models are also crucial to those from less fortunate backgrounds. There also must be, there must be bright minds in rural areas who can scale and get to the next level by just being mentored. Um, thank you so much for those tweets. I feel like he echoes, Brenna, what you're saying. Let's not leave certain youth segments behind, you know, whether it's rural, whether it's urban, uh, whether it's those who are fortunate and those less fortunate in terms of, you know, material things. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to just thank our guests, uh, Uli Keita and Dana Mukundwa. Um, if you could have them on our screens, thank you so much um, for, for joining us uh, tonight. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much for having Thank us. you. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank um, resident panelists, Charles Saba, uh, Brennan Amata, all these salient points uh, like 
our, our, our tips have said. Uh, thank you very much. Um, to our viewers for tuning in and sharing in, you know, your comments, thank you very much. It's been an honor. Um, to our partners, Bourbon Collection and uh, Uzi, thank you for always supporting the square. And it's been a great second part series on the issue of youth employment or unemployment, if you will, and what we can do as a country and continent when it comes to scaling skills uh, skills development, looking at the future of work and the ever-evolving uh, labor market. Thank you for tuning in and sharing your insights. Uh, have a good night. See you again next week.